The president of the Electoral Chamber of the Supreme Court of Venezuela announced that she has started a technical analysis of all the electoral material consigned related to the elections of July 28th. The Israeli army continues to intensify its attacks against the Gaza Strip when the genocide against the Palestinian population reaches 316 days and over 40,000 people have been killed. In Thailand's House of Representatives elected 37-year-old Petang Tan Shinawatra as their new prime minister. Hello and welcome to From the South. My name is Belen de los Santos. I'm from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We'll begin with the news. The president of the Electoral Chamber of the Supreme Court of Venezuela, Cadiz Lía Rodríguez, announced that they have started a technical analysis of all the electoral material consigned related to the elections of July 28th. Rodríguez informed that the National Electoral Council has provided all the digital and physical electoral material for the investigation process. Likewise, she pointed out that the investigation will be carried out by the best technical and specialized team until the High Court gathers the necessary evidence to certify the decision of the Venezuelan people. In addition, Rodriguez reiterated the commitment of the judiciary to import justice in the face of a cybernetic coup of the global ultra-right that was denounced by the re-elected President Nicolás Maduro. Visto que, mediante sentencia número 29 de fecha 10 de agosto del 2024, In view of the fact that, by means of judgment number 29, dated August 10, 2024, the magistrate of this electoral chamber will order an expert appraisal of all the electoral material of evidentiary value consigned in physical or digital form related to the presidential election process held on July 28, 2024. This chamber will make the following considerations. First, this electoral chamber shall proceed to perform in person the supervision and control of the expertise process of the material. That is in the custody of the National Electoral Council and in the custody of the CNE, the political organizations and the former candidates, said expertise is in process of execution. By a group of experts in electoral material with the highest technical and scientific, national and international standards, guaranteeing the highest level of technical and legal excellence, which shall be performed directly, personally and daily during the entire process. And various social and political Dominican organizations expressed their solidarity with Venezuela as that nation is being under attack after the July 28th presidential elections. On a press briefing, Dominican revolutionaries claim that the U.S. plans to make a coup d'etat against the Venezuelan people. On a press release, they ratified that Venezuela sets the National Electoral Council as the entity empowered to arbitrate the elections, as well as to give the results and in compliance with the constitutional United Nations Charter, its decisions must be respected by all countries. They further demanded that the Dominican Republic president, Luis Abinader, stop compromising the country with meddling actions against other nations and be guided by the constitution of the republic. The history of humanity knows no country more despotic and terrorist than the United States. Those who are aligned with the U.S. are the actual dictators and the despots. Yes, they are the criminal and the terrorist. This is the truth that is systematically hidden by media dictatorship. Which countries are encouraging precisely that meeting? Countries that are puppets, that are lackeys of the U.S., so those nations have not proven their true sovereignty and self-determination. Those are the ones that want to impose a meeting of that nature in the Dominican Republic. Here we say no. And we say in Venezuela as the National Assembly approved a bill that regulates NGOs operation and requires transparency of their funding sources. Lawmakers say this law fills a legal void in the country. Our correspondent Leonel Retamal has the details. 
After finishing its reading discussion item by item, parliamentarians approved the legislation that regulates the operation of non-governmental organizations. The public consultation over this law started in January 2024, and by this week members of the National Assembly finally passed it. Please, raise your hands if you agree on its approval. Consequently, the law for the audit, regularization, performance and financing of non-governmental organizations and non-profit social organizations is hereby unanimously passed. We declare the legislation approved. NGOs are organizations that work on the public policy, environment, human rights, LGBTQ communities and other civil society affairs, such as civil foundations and associations. So far, there has been no legal framework to regulate their operations. The National Assembly is in tune with an important decision, which is to guarantee that the operating NGOs in the country comply with the requirements that have been established. NGOs have to register, they have to transparently show their accounts, where their incomes come from, where their expenses go and fundamentally NGOs ought to dedicate themselves to the activity for which they are created. Parliamentarians underscore that the law does not seek to ban the NGOs' work, but to make their operations more transparent. This law was like a pending matter that we had for quite some time, and one watches the hypocrisy of the institutions and of some countries, we saw in these days someone from the UN, the rapporteur spoke that Venezuela should abstain. But the European Union prohibits, for instance, the use of Russian funds in NGOs, it is banned by law. There are nations that have made their legal reforms to review where the funds come from, that's what we are willing to find out. Following the latest violent riots, legislators and authorities have denounced the link between some NGOs and the sponsorship of criminal or terrorist organizations. One knows how NGOs operate in other countries when they have some health contingency, some humanitarian crisis. We are watching them in Palestine, they are fully identified, they use their ID cards, they identify their vehicles, they have a humanitarian reason, a social and altruistic work. In Venezuela, this does not happen. They all operate under the table. But why? Because here, NGOs are directly tied up with the political conspiracy. Following the latest violent riots, legislators and authorities have denounced the link between some NGOs and the sponsorship of criminal or terrorist organizations. Now let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates and much more. We'll be right back, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. One of Argentina's main worker union, the autonomous CTA, together with other labor and social organizations, announced on Friday that they will intensify their campaign against the decree of necessity and urgency that was signed by President Javier Millet at the beginning of his mandate. Workers emphasized that social groups continue to collect signatures against the governmental measure with the aim of having it annulled by the Chamber of Deputies and the Supreme Court. The decree promoted by Javier Millet modifies and eliminates more than 300 regulations, among them the laws regarding rent, supply, land, industrial and commercial promotion. And on Friday, the strike at the Chilean mine known as Escondida, the world's largest open pit copper mine, entered its fourth day with no agreement between the Chilean workers and the transnational company BHP. The union maintained its demand for more rest time, better wages, an increase in the amount of bonuses given to the miners and compensation for those who are fired for all the time they have worked there. The union emphasized that the dialogues to resolve the conflict have failed, denouncing that the company is trying to condition the dialogues on the suspension of the strike, besides limiting the talks to only two of their demands. In this context, they added that a salary adjustment of 2% and a health insurance plan of 100% were considered insufficient. And the delegates of the government of Colombia for the dialogue table with the National Liberation Army showed their position regarding the freezing of the process. Our colleague Hernán Tobar has the details. Let's see. The government 
made public the confidential proposal it made to the National Liberation Army days ago, aimed at paving the way to unfreeze the dialogue table which has been paralyzed since the end of May. There is no problem with making the so-called confidential proposal public. It was proposed to them to make viable the proposal on economic reform that was agreed with the NLA which was signed as the first point of agreement with the country's business community and the social movement of Colombia to discuss the mechanisms for its implementation. It seems that they are not interested in the subject. Esto suscitó la reacción. This provoked the reaction of the opposition sectors in the country which criticized this proposal. On the other hand, the members of the dialogue table on the part of the government assured that the objective is to look for ways to resume the dialogue. Poder generar un espacio to be able to generate a space in which the social movements, the government and the National Liberation Army, along with the business community, are present. What is the purpose? To discuss the transformations contained in an agreement that I invite you to read. As topics for dialogue, I ask you to read the axis of the economic model contained in agreement number 28. Changes can be introduced in this model if there is an agreement in which the businessmen are willing, the government is willing, and the social movement is willing. Obviously, this possibility can be opened. The head of the government delegation for the dialogues reiterated her willingness to engage in conversations. The NLA has the possibility and the responsibility now to say how we continue. That is, we always have the disposition. At no time, and we are not going to do it, we have a clear conduct that we do not break the dialogues. We consider that the only valid mechanism to move forward with a peaceful process that is a table, a table that dialogues. The NLA assures that the government has failed to comply with the agreements, among them the demand to be removed from the list of organized armed groups as well as the collusion between some military and paramilitary groups in several regions. Analysts express their concern about this scenario, but consider it positive that the NLA maintains the unilateral ceasefire. We applaud, of course, the announcement by the National Liberation Army to maintain the ceasefire unilaterally. We are very concerned that at a given moment the talks have been truncated again, and that once again the talks are entering a lethargy, and perhaps also because it is not very conducive to a process of trust that at a given moment there are secret talks behind the nation's back, as it is said to have been held someday with the National Liberation Army. A prompt response is expected from the National Liberation Army to restart the dialogue process. We now move on to other topics. In Puerto Rico, at least 900,000 people are without electric service after the passage of Hurricane Ernesto. On Thursday, the Emergency Operations Center of Puerto Rico, Luma, activated its restoration process to address the impact of Tropical Storm Ernesto, which became a hurricane. According to Morning Report, Luma Energy detailed that slightly more than 470,000 customers or subscribers were without electric service, which represents 31.9% of the total users. The company's president and chief executive officer, Juan Saca, said that Luma has been working around the clock to, ask, to assess the damage, re-energize the affected portions of the power grid, and restore power to all affected users. The power outage left us in the dark for over 24 hours even before the storm. I have elderly people and others who are bedridden. I don't know how much longer the blackout will be. We can't stand it. We have a side control break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you will be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away.
Welcome back from the south. The Israeli army continues to intensify its attacks against the Gaza Strip, when the genocide against the Palestinian population reaches 316 days and more than 40,000 people have been killed. In this regard, the Ministry of Health in Gaza informed on Thursday that seven people were martyred and several were wounded after an Israeli bombardment of a residential building in Yavalia in the north of the Gaza Strip. In the meantime, they also noted that another attack claimed the lives of five civilians and injured eight in the al Darash area. In this way, the Israeli occupation forces continue their aggression against the Gaza Strip by land, sea and air since October of last year, despite the international community call for an immediate ceasefire. The Israeli occupation forces continue to commit genocide and massacres against the Palestinian people. Several floors in this building, which the Al Ahmad family owns, were targeted. I know this family well. They are civilians and innocent. A large number of people were killed, including children, women and seniors. And in this context, the victims also reflected on the hypocrisy of the Israeli regime that attends negotiation talks in Qatar while continuing to massacre civilians. We came to the place and found hanging bodies and limbs on the ground. We couldn't assist them because of the severity of the scene. We were really terrified. We wonder how we are negotiating in Doha, and why did Israeli PM Netanyahu send a delegation to the talks while we are being killed here? The fighting should at least stop during the negotiations. And on Friday in Palestine, dozens of Israeli settlers stormed into the village of Jit in the occupied West Bank. In this sense, local authorities said that the extremists shot dead one young man and seriously wounded another, in addition to setting fire to houses and vehicles. In this regard, they identified a fatality as Rashid Mahmoud Seda of 23 years old, while another young Palestinian was taken to the hospital with chest wounds. On the other hand, Israeli media reported that about 50 settlers, some of them hooded, entered the village where they fired shots through stones and Molotov cocktails. It is worth noting that more than 700,000 Israeli settlers live in the occupied West Bank and use violence on a daily basis to harass the Palestinian population. And we stay in Palestine as the demonstration took place in the city of Ramallah in support of the Gaza Strip population and to condemn the crimes of the Israeli occupation army. In this regard, on Thursday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets to demand an end to the genocide in Gaza, which has killed over 40,000 people. During the demonstration, participants raised Palestinian flags and chanted slogans in support of the resistance. Those present also denounced the silence and complicity of some international governments concerning the massacres committed by the Tel Aviv regime. And in this context, on Thursday during his speech in front of the Great Assembly in Turkey, the president of the Palestinian National Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, announced his decision to go to Gaza with all the Palestinian leaders. At the event held in Ankara, Abbas also called for the international support to ensure his safe arrival in Gaza. The president also urged world leaders and the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, to visit the besieged territory whose death toll has risen to over 40,000 after October 7, 2023. I announce before you, before the entire world, and our Palestinian people, since we are left with no other solutions, that I have decided to go to the Gaza Strip with all members of the Palestinian leadership. In other news, on Thursday, authorities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo reported 548 deaths due to the outbreak of the infectious disease known as Mpox virus. In the sense, Minister Samuel Roger Kamba added that in addition to the death toll, the country has also registered a total of 15,664 potential cases so far in 2024. 
For his part, Kamba also indicated that the virus is affecting most of the provinces of the nation that has 2.3 million square kilometers and a population of 96 million. In this regard, also on Thursday, the World Health Organization declared the Mpox virus an international public health emergency that is the highest level of alert. It must be emphasized that the current epidemic in the Democratic Republic of the Congo has a mortality rate estimated at 3.6%. And on Friday, Thailand House of Representatives elected a new prime minister. Petong Tan Shinavatra, daughter of the former president and influential politician Taksin, won 319 votes of the 493 deputies in the current chamber and is the second woman to become the country's prime minister. At 37, she was one of the new faces of her party during the 2023 election campaign and is now the youngest to hold the post. The decision comes on the heels of the dismissal two days ago of Shreta Tapsin, who, according to a court, violated the code of ethics established in the Constitution. Right now, of course, today is, I feel very honored and I feel very happy. I really hope that I can make the people feel confident about um, that we can uh, to build the opportunities and to improve the quality of life and to empower to all ties. And on Friday, the Chinese spokesperson of the Ministry of Defense, Sang Xiongang, denounced the U.S. and Japan warlike stances, warning that they are raising regional tensions. Earlier, the U.S. stated that China posed a military global threat and thus Yongang described the allegation as an excuse to stir up conflicts in Asia. He charged the U.S. with posing the largest global menace for the ongoing biggest nuclear arsenal. Likewise, the spokesperson reaffirmed its nation's sovereignty over the islands of the Sea of the Southern China and its surrounding waters and warned against any attempt of trespassing this space. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and also on TikTok. For Telesur English, my name is Belen de los Santos. Thank you for watching.